Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Royal Society Winton Prize for Science Books, the announcement of the winner, and also, most importantly, a chance for us to meet all six nominated authors and to hear some of their work. It is a pleasure, as always, my name is Dara Breen, to see a packed room uh, for an event like this. Uh, proof further that this is a hot subject in which people have a huge amount of interest and intrigue. It is uh, one of the joys of the small part of my life which is spent doing science communication and standing next to scientists. Uh, that is, there is such an appetite for this. And we'll see, obviously, from the hunger there is for the, uh, for the reading and the writing of these books as well. I did a thing, I do a show on the BBC called, the, uh, called Science Club. And we came Asian ticket to festival, we've taken to Cheltenham this year, we, tell you, we took it to Dublin, uh, in which we do a live version of it where scientists come on, they do some experiments, they talk about their work, we do questions with the audience, and it's always a very vibrant and exciting evening. And the night before we were doing the one in Dublin, I attended a comedy festival at which there are friends of mine involved in the comedy world, a guy who's a sitcom director and a man who's been in Father Ted, and I was explaining to them what I was doing the following night, and I said, well, it's a very interesting night because we bring scientists out and they talk about their work and what they do, and then they do experiments, and there's questions, and they answer the questions. And the two of them looked at me in a deeply bewildered and shocked way until one of them, out of, just out of something to say, went, and who would go to that? Uh, so, <laughs> so you go to that. Uh, and, uh, and it is a pleasure to have you here. We have a sort of format here, ladies and gentlemen. We will be announcing the winner of the prize. But before that, we have all six shortlisted authors with us. Uh, we'll be listening to readings from their books as well as finding out the winner. Uh, this prize has been around since 1988 with the same aim to encourage the writing, publishing and reading of good and accessible popular science books. It is going to become one of the UK's most prestigious non-fiction literary prizes and our thanks go to this for the continued support of Winton Capital Management for that. It celebrates books, it says here, but which I endorse, they make science more accessible that are a pleasure to read, are as enlightening, imaginative, revealing and stimulating as only the best literature is. And this is beautifully reflected in the list we have tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that cover go from the oceans to the skies, from the mind to the very building blocks of matter. These books can agitate and they can illuminate and they can inspire. And the authors we have here will speak with some passion, I'd imagine, on the topics on which they have written. Now, as well as that, by the way, after we've heard about the shortlisted books, we will offer a chance, we'll have a chat with each of them in turn, a brief chat, and then we'll have all of them on the, on, the, on the dais here in front of us. We will also throw it over to yourselves, again, for a brief question and answer. You may direct the question specifically or more generally to the panel. We'll have a few minutes of that before we find out who the actual winners are, but all the books are also available. I would like to mention the judges of this year's prize who are sitting in our front row here, and we thank them for their excellent work at whittling down, I believe, 150 books it was, down to the six that we have here to celebrate tonight. Dr. Emily Flashman, the Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Fellow at the University of Oxford, impressionist, comedian and keen amateur astronomer John Coleshaw, Joanne Harris, novelist, author of many novels, including Chocolat, Lucy Siegel, journalist and writer on environmental issues, and the chair of the judges, Professor Uta Frith, Emeritus Professor of Cognitive Development at University College London. Our thanks and applause to our panel of judges, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, my God. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let us meet the first of our authors. Our first author is a Professor of Behaviour and Ecology in the Department of Animal and Plant Sciences at the University of Sheffield. He has written for The Independent, The New Scientist and BBC Wildlife. The book is Bird Sense by Tim Burkhead. My research is on infidelity in birds. Now, most, most birds are monogamous, but um, they engage in what we call extra pair copulations. And that's very widespread. And we have, we've only known that for a relatively short period of time. And because of that, you shouldn't be surprised to know that birds have lots of adaptations that help them minimise the negative effects of being cuckolded, but help them maximise the effect of their matings. As a result, I'm passionately interested in copulation behaviour of birds. And often I'm asked whether birds might enjoy the same kind of pleasure from mating that humans do. And since my uh, book is about the senses of birds, uh, this particular topic uh, relates to the sense of touch. 
Now, in some species, like the European dunnock, which is common in most people's gardens, it's hard to imagine copulation being satisfying or pleasurable because it lasts only a tenth of a second. But there's one bird where the evidence for copulation being pleasurable is strikingly apparent, and that's in a bird called the red-billed buffalo weaver, which breeds in Africa. And this bird has several unique claims to fame, uh, one of which is the possession of a false penis. And now most birds don't have a penis at all, so having a false one um, is pretty bizarre. And um, even uh, Alan Bennett and Les Dawson would uh, enjoy this, uh, the idea of a false penis. Now before I read a little piece from the book, I think I should give you a, a kind of short health warning. I don't want to offend anybody, um, I'm just simply going to describe things as they are, okay? So this uh, paragraph or two relates to a research programme that we had a few years ago on these buffalo weavers. The most surprising result of all was that after fully 30 minutes of vigorous venery, that's copulation, the male buffalo weaver appeared to experience an orgasm. This was unheard of. No other bird in the world was known to climax. In a state of, a state of high excitement, Mark, who was my PhD student, phoned me to tell me about it. I was very sceptical at first. How do you know the male is experiencing an orgasm, I said. It would be, indeed, it would be very hard to tell whether a male of another ex, other species was experiencing ecstasy in the same way as ourselves. The way Mark discovered the answer may sound weird, perverse even, but biologists sometimes have to do funny things in the search for the truth. Reasoning that what the male was doing was simultaneously stimulating both himself and the female by rubbing his phalloid organ around her cloacal region during his extended mounting, Mark decided to massage a male in the hand for the same time to see what happened. After 25 minutes of manipulation, <laughs> Mark gently squeezed the phalloid organ. The result was spectacular. The wing beats slowed to a quiver. The entire body shuddered. The, fleet, the feet clenched tightly onto Mark's hand, and the male ejaculated. Must have been there right here. Yes, Tim, you get to read about sex and sit unnaturally closely to me. Uh, for the... <laughs> Thanks for setting the tone. Uh, that's been delightful. It is an intriguing journey to it all because it, our, our idea, our sense of bird sense, tends to begin and start at eyesight. Yeah. And is that, I mean, that's a very restrictive view. Isn't no, it? no birds, birds have fantastic eyesight. It's just that everything else has been eclipsed as a result of us focusing on eyesight. So they have the full gamut of senses that we have and some extra ones as well. So phrases like, you know, eyes like a hawk, the, these have, to extent them, been, yes. Overdone. Un, overdone and un, un, unhelpful in, in our perception of them. Unhelpful in the sense that it does uh, f f focus people away from the, those other senses that I describe in the book. Yeah. We would not expect to, you know, they've, they've very acute hearing, some of them. Yep. Owls in particular, am I right? Yep, yeah. Owls have wonderful, large, asymmetrically positioned ears so they can hunt entirely by sound. Yeah. Really? And it's yeah. not like, like a bat, they're just listening in on what the environment is presenting, they're not seeking out? Listening to, well, the classic case is the great grey owl hunting mice under the snow. So they can't see them, they're daytime hunters, and they can just hear extremely well. And then they, you've seen this on Attenborough, they just pound through the snow and grab the mouse. Is it a sense of smell? Uh, owls don't use a sense of smell for that. But there are, the, but there are, are other, other birds, yeah, kiwi has a fantastic sense of smell. It's got its nostrils on the tip of its beak and a huge part of its brain uh, given over to processing olfactory stimuli, yeah. And touch is another one which is, uh, again, because of, possibly just because of, this may be anthropomorphic, but the, that it's with claws rather than with, with no, pads no, not, of fingers. No, no, Cla the claws would be relatively insensitive, yeah. but the skin itself is extremely sensitive. And lots of birds like the guillemots that I spent 40 years studying um, spend hours and hours allopreening each other. You're kind of me doing this and yeah. then going, kind of yeah, I like that. That's all right, it's fine. <laughs> I'll probably have, I probably it's have usually reciprocated, but in this case, I'd no. rather you didn't. Okay, okay. that'd be, that'd be <laughs> slightly, we only have three minutes. Uh, as well. the, uh, for how much allopreening you can do in that amount of time. The, uh, and then the one which is probably most surprising to people is there, 
a possibly an inner emotional life. Okay, this is a um, very sensitive, controversial area. Some people believe that animals can't experience emotions in the same way that we do because they don't have consciousness in the same way. But if you've spent a lot of time, like I have, watching birds, sometimes it's just almost inescapable. So on one occasion, I was doing field work in Labrador, and at the, right at the beginning of the season, female guillemot came back to her breeding site on the cliff, and the next day I expected hubby to turn up, and he didn't. So she waited on her own for about a week, and then she kind of called somebody over, and she repaired with somebody else. And I was sitting in my hide, and I, this, the, the, part, the male partner uh, was very distinct, and I saw him swimming in from the sea, and I thought, this is going to be interesting. And he kind of landed on the beach, hopped up, and started walking up, and he got halfway up the beach, and I could see him look and go, who the hell is that? <laughs> and, and then he walked up, and he just beat the living daylights out of the new male who kind of stood back going, whoa, whoa, you know. And then he went into a greeting ceremony with his partner that just went on and on and on. And it's really, when you see something like that happening, you think, you know, there is actually quite a lot more going on in their heads than we give them credit for. Is there a particular breed? I mean, guillemots feature quite heavily in the book. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I've they... spent more time studying guillemots yes. than anything else. It's not that they have a particularly richer no, interior life. I think yeah, they have a very uh, complex and rich social life because they're all packed together on the cliff. And they live for about 25 or 30 years and they often sit as close as this to each other so, for, and they come back to the same spot year after year so they get to know all their neighbours. So there are kind of friendships built up. Now, and not to make this paint them as an entirely benign community, I mean, you do talk about them not necessarily they caring for each other as young as yeah. communally, except at times of distress where they felt... Well, one of, one of the tragic things that's happening with guillemot populations around the British coast is that overfishing and climate change has resulted in a complete lack of fish, particularly in the north of Britain. And a few years ago, a colleague of mine was working on the Isle of May. There were no fish. And the birds sat on their eggs, hatched, hatched the chicks, and then the chicks starved to death. And occasionally when a bird did find a fish, they all fought over it. And eventually things became so stressful that adults were throwing each other's chicks off the ledge so that the, to reduce the competition. And really uh, very, very distressing. The next year there were a few more fish and everything kind of went back to normal. So I think you know, there's kind of, it's easy to draw parallels between humans under incredibly stressful situations, people being very unpleasant to each other. But it was a real shock to see a species that generally is extremely social and cooperative behaving in this way. But it's just a measure of how much stress they were under. Okay, so it's a much richer internal life, much richer sense review they have of the world than we've previously given them credit for. Absolutely. Lovely. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, our second uh, author tonight is the author of the acclaimed From Eternity to Here and is star of theoretical physics based at the California Institute of Technology. Also one of the founders of CosmicVariance.com, named as a top five science blog by Nature and a television presenter. He's also unique among the authors tonight as being the only one who's stolen one of my jokes to tell on the Stephen Colbert show. So, uh, <laughs> we've, we've gotten over that. Uh, so, given that I've never been on the Colbert show myself, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, reading from The Particle at the End of the Universe, please welcome Sean Carroll. I don't think we've gotten over that as much as Dara's claims we've gotten over that, but we will, we will. Um, most of the time, almost always, science communication is this wonderful thing to be able to do because it's a celebration, it's a, a chance to be struck with awe and to share that awe very widely, but sometimes science communication involves a bit of damage control. So I'm going to be reading from uh, the beginning of chapter two of my book called Next to Godliness. Leon Letterman has had second thoughts. He knows what he's done, but he can't take it back. It's just one of those small things that has enormous unintended consequences. We're speaking, of course, of the God particle. Not the particle itself, which is the celebrated Higgs boson, which this book is about, but the name God particle for which Letterman is responsible. One of the world's great experimental physicists, Leon Letterman won the Nobel Prize in 1988 for discovering there is more than one type of neutrino. If he hadn't won it for that, he has other achievements that would be equally prize-worthy, including the discovery of a new kind of quark. Now, there are only three known neutrinos in nature and six known quarks, so these kinds of achievements aren't exactly growing on trees. 
And in his spare time, Letterman has served as the director of Fermilab outside Chicago, and he also founded the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy. Letterman is also a charismatic personality, famous among his colleagues for his humor and storytelling ability. One of his favorites relates the time when, while he was a graduate student in the 1950s, Letterman arranged to bump into Albert Einstein during a walk on the grounds of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. The great man listened patiently as Leon Letterman, the eager youngster, explained the various types of particle physics research he was doing as a student at Columbia. And then Einstein said with a kindly smile, that is not interesting. <laughs> but in the public eye, Leon Letterman is better known for something less felicitous, coining the phrase, the God particle, to refer to the Higgs boson. Indeed, that's the title of a book on particle physics and the search for the Higgs that he wrote with Dick Terezi. As the authors explain in chapter one of their book, they chose the phrase in part because the publisher wouldn't let us call it the goddamn particle, though that might have been a more appropriate title given its villainous nature and all the expense it is causing. Physicists around the world, a notoriously fractious bunch, will happily agree on one thing. They hate the name the god particle. Peter Higgs, the British physicist for whom the more traditional name is derived, says with a laugh, I was really rather annoyed with that book, and I think I'm not the only one. Meanwhile, journalists around the world, who can be quite contentious in their own right, find unanimity on a different point. They love the God particle. One of the safest bets in the world is that if you find an article in the popular press about the Higgs boson, at least at some point, it will be called the God particle. And you can hardly blame the journalists. As names go, God particle is totally box office, while Higgs boson comes off as a bit inscrutable. But you can't blame the physicists either. The Higgs has nothing whatsoever to do with God. It's just a really important particle, one that's worth getting excited about, even if that excitement doesn't quite rise to the level of religious ecstasy. We should try to understand why a physicist might be tempted to bestow godlike status on this humble elementary particle, even if it is actually free of any theological implications whatsoever. Does anyone really think God plays favorites among the particles? Sean, thank you very much. Uh, we have three minutes to which to explain the fundamental building blocks of nature. Uh, where would you like to start? The, uh, you were there in the day. Uh, I was there. When the, when the uh, results were announced. July 4th, 2012 at CERN, when we found out that they had in fact found it in a very emotional, uh, it was a big day because they had been looking for decades. And I say they, because I'm a theoretical physicist. Uh, you know, I joke somewhere else in the book that the major occupational hazard of theoretical physicists is caffeine overdose. Uh, experimental physicists spend decades of their lives underground building things, and, that, and they're the ones who actually made it happen. And there was no guarantee that we were, there were people losing their nerve before we found it, saying, you know, what if it's not there? And uh, it was the goal for literally decades, and so it was quite an event. Um, and we say that we, we, they found it, they found a Higgs type particle. That's right. They've since narrowed it down to, oh, and in terms of, they've, they've narrowed down in terms of the spin of this particle they found, they've narrowed down certain other parameters, but they don't know if that's the only one, for example. Yeah, I mean, the, when we say the Higgs particle, what we mean is that there was a theory that was put together by a bunch of people, of whom Higgs was one, back uh, before I was born, in the very early 1960s. And, uh, and that's just one of the triumphs, to me, of human intellectual capacity, is that just by trying to mathematically understand how the forces of nature work. You could sit there in your office in 1964 as a struggling postdoc and write down a set of equations and then 48 years and $9 billion later, there's a little bump in the, in the, in the data. Uh, so that model fits the data. The, the model they wrote down is augmented later by uh, Steven Weinberg and Abdus Salam. But we still not are we're still not sure that's the absolute final model. In fact, we're pretty sure it's not. We are pretty sure there's more to the world than that. There's dark matter, there's dark energy. There's a whole realm of physics that we now understand, and it's a triumphant uh, thing to be happy about, but it's not the end of the road. And will the, the LHC help us understand this, or do we have to build a yet larger collider? We're hoping that the LHC uh, helps us understand this, but we, we also need to admit that the Higgs boson was the one thing that we were pretty darn sure the LHC would be able to find. Beyond that, there are dozens of competing models, and by dozens, I should say dozens of dozens of competing models for what could come next. Many of these models predict things that will appear at the LHC. Right now, the LHC is, is turned off 
while they go in there and they tighten the screws and it's going to come back at a higher energy in a couple of years. But it might be that the interesting things to find are not accessible at those energies. So that's, we'll have to take what nature gives us. The, uh, now we know where the Higgs, when we, when we say we know where, the, we know at what energy we can find the Higgs. Right. Does that mean we can build a Higgs producing machine? We can, we can build what we cleverly call a Higgs factory. And the great thing about that is that uh, in you know, one of the, the subtext of my book, because I know you're all eager to buy it, but you're not sure. So <laughs> the reason to buy it is it explains quantum field theory. And I think that that's what people really <laughs> want, right? That so is, yeah. uh, <laughs> the world is made of fields vibrating and talking to each other. And the Higgs is the most sociable of them all. It talks to everything, as far as we know. And therefore, by studying what the Higgs decays into, in very careful ways, we can figure out what other kinds of particles there might be. So building a Higgs factory is a very, is a very good goal to have. Could you find yourself spending the rest of your life explaining to people what the Higgs boson actually is? I could do that. I won't do that. I'm, you know, uh, I, I did that. Now I'm going to do other things. <laughs> yes. uh, but you know, I, I'm very, very uh, much against the idea Forgetting about the Higgs boson, just things like quantum mechanics and relativity, the idea that these are ununderstandable. I mean, these are completely understandable. It might be easier to understand some things than others, but the idea of the Higgs boson, the Higgs field that permeates the space around us, this invisible energy field that makes electrons and atoms and chemistry possible and makes literally our life itself possible, these are understandable concepts. And the reason we paid $9 billion is not because the Higgs boson is going to let us travel through time or cure malaria or anything like that. It's because we want to know how the world works. And it is possible to understand how the world works. And I can recommend a good book. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Perfect point. OK, the next author we'll hear about is the professor of biology at the University of East Anglia. Works at the John Innes Center in Norwich as well, where he's working on the genetic control of plant <laughs> development. The book is From Cell Sorry, excuse me, Cells to Civilizations by Enrico Cohen. Hello, I'm uh, going to take do a reading from towards the end of the book where I try and summarize some of, bring together some of the ideas that I talk about throughout the book. Cezanne was a man obsessed. Some of his obsessions were rather unfortunate. He developed a terrible fear of being touched, as Emile Bernard came to realize after he made the mistake of trying to help him from falling one day. But his obsession with apples is something for which we are eternally grateful. Cezanne painted more than 30 still lives with apples. According to the critic Geoffroy, Cezanne proclaimed, I will astonish Paris with an apple. His aim was not simply to copy apples, but to use these humble subjects to explore relationships in colour, tonality and form. Cézanne is reported to have said, to paint from nature is to set free the essence of the model. Painting does not mean slavishly copying an object. The artist must perceive and capture harmony from among many relationships. Each artist may capture these harmonies and relationships in their own way. Compare Cezanne's painting with Renoir's treatment of a similar subject done at around the same time. Renoir's apples seem softer than Cezanne's and lack their strong sculptural quality because he saw and painted them in his own way. Scientists also portray apples in several ways. The apples of physics come in several varieties. There is Newton's apple, which falls according to the law of gravity, and Einstein's relativistic version embedded in space-time. There is also the apple of quantum mechanics, comprising numerous particles that behave in a bizarre and fuzzy manner when we look closely. Then there are the various apples that arise through life's creative recipe. The apple that has been honed over many generations of natural selection. The apple tree that develops from a small pip. And the apple that we learn to appreciate through our neural frameworks. All of these apples are connected with each other.
Enrico, thank you very, very much. The, uh, there is a phrase in that that I want to pick up on, which I think sums up a lot of what you wrote, because this book is one that probably most advances a big idea, as it were, a unifying idea, and that is the idea of life's creative recipe, that there are certain principles that have guided, let's say, four things that happen at different scales, whether it's evolution, uh, growth and development, learning, and then cultural development, but that the same principles underlie all of those. Could you explain that to us? So I can't go through all the principles, but maybe I can give, give an example of, of some of the key ideas. So let's take one of the principles is the notion of reinforcement and competition. Uh, so to give a cultural example of reinforcement, suppose you told a really good joke, okay? And um, you tell it to some people, and then the, those people tell other people the joke, and so the, the joke spreads very, very rapidly through a multiplicative process. Um, but then eventually, everyone gets to hear the joke. Okay, so eventually, nobody, they say, well, why are you telling me this joke? Everyone, everyone knows that joke. So the joke becomes a victim of its own success. So as something spreads, then eventually it brings, out its, it brings about its own demise, as it were, and that brings, ushers in new jokes, competition for new jokes, to sort of oust, as it were, the old joke in terms of the joke, the joke to tell. And that, that idea, that thing, that this notion of, of, of self-reinforcement and boosting, bringing about its own demise, turns out, to, for example, to be common to a whole set of processes, the four processes that you described, except that the, what's being boosted and reinforced is very different. So in the case of evolution, for example, you might be boosting uh, genes, particular genes or variants of genes, th through the notion of reproductive success, and that brings about its own problems and, and eventually its limitations. Um, in the process of development, you might be boosting the activity of particular genes, or proteins might be reinforcing their own activities, um, that again it res results in the patterning of, of tissues into, into cells into different, different regions. Um, and in terms of the brain, for example, we're, the, the, our learning depends on certain connections in our brains boosting themselves according to certain experiences and stimuli, but again, eventually those plateau um, as a consequence of that, of that self-reinforcing mechanism. And in, in the culture, of course, I gave the example of the joke, but it applies to any cultural achievement. Like we're driven by this process of sort of reinforcement that then um, propagation that then brings about its own sort of issues of, and limitations. So that, that's, that's one of the examples of, this, of the key ideas that often represent as sort of feedback loops that are the core of these different types of transformation. And these occur at different scales. To a certain extent, though, they sit on top of each other. Each is a platform. For, I mean, obviously, evolution is the very basis of this. Growth occurs on top of that. Learning occurs once the growth has occurred, and then culture because of that. Yes and no. So in one sense, that's true. But um, science, for example, has a very peculiar position in this because, in a sense, scientific understanding underpins culture in one sense because we're all sitting here. We're not monkeys having this conversation. All right? we're, we, we're able to have a cultural... Uh, our cultural achievements reflect our biology as human beings, like our abilities as human beings. And so in that sense, they're a reflection. Science tells us about how we became human, as it were, through evolution and, and all the processes um, that I described. But also, science is a product of culture as well. It's, it's, it's one of the most magnificent cultural achievements. Not only underlies culture, it's a product of culture. And it's through science, actually, that we try and understand all these processes. So it's not really... So in a sense, science is, but sits at the top and at the bottom. Actually, there isn't a top and bottom. In a sense, it's a loop. Because what we really do are, are trying to look back on ourselves and try and understand where, 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 are we, where do we come from. And, of course, we can't take ourselves out of that picture much as we would like to. Um, we're part of the picture that, that we're trying to explain. So in that sense, it's not really simply a, a stacking of one thing on top of another. It's a more risky book to write in some ways, this, because it is, it is a dangerously large idea open to criticism more easily that you're trying to expand here. Yes, that's, I suppose that's true. But at the end of the day, you write a book because you have to go with what you believe and what you, what you conclude, okay? So if you write a book in a fearful way of thinking, well, what will they think? And should I, should I not say this because I'm too worried about how it would come across? I think you probably shouldn't be writing. I mean, to me, you write a book because you want to say something, and if other people don't respond to that or whatever, you do, you do the best that you can, and that's all that you can do. Thank you very much. Enrico Cohn, ladies and gentlemen.
Our next author is a writer and psychologist. His previous book, The Baby in the Mirror, was also critically acclaimed in the UK and has been translated into seven languages. He's a reader in psychology at Durham University and has written for The Guardian, The Financial Times and The Sunday Telegraph. The book is Pieces of Light and it's by Charles Fernihock. <laughs> Thank you, Dara. My book is about memory. I remembered the open air swimming pool at Cremorne Point in, on Sydney Harbour. In fact, I spent a certain amount of time wandering around trying to find this place that I so vividly remembered, only to realise that it wasn't where I had left it. And in fact, in time, I realised after hours of walking around that it didn't exist. It wasn't the thing I remembered. It, it, I had entirely imagined it. So this is a bit of scene setting for this scene about the relationship between imagination and memory. I remembered going to the swimming pool on Cremorne Point because I had so strenuously imagined it. When I lost my ability to adjudicate between memory and fantasy, I plumped for memory. In a sense, I was remembering. I had a memory for something I had imagined. The imagining was there and the feeling of remembering was there. Together, they were enough to persuade me that the event actually happened. This particular kind of false memory has now been investiga investigated quite thoroughly by experimental psychologists. Several studies have shown that the process of imagining an event makes people more likely subsequently to have a memory for it. This conversion of an imagining into a memory is known as imagination inflation. In one experiment, volunteers went on a walk around a university campus with a researcher and were, and were asked either to perform or to imagine performing some weird and some not so weird actions. For example, at a campus Pepsi machine, the relevant action was either to check the machine for change or to get down on one knee and propose marriage to it. For both familiar and bizarre actions, the mere act of imagining performing the action led to subsequent false memories. You only need to imagine proposing to a Pepsi machine once to run the risk of having a false memory for having done so. The, the phenomenon of imagination inflation has serious implications for the way we treat memories of childhood. In one study, researchers asked adult participants in the UK about a series of events from their childhoods and asked them to imagine them happening. One of, one of the events, having a milk tooth extracted by a dentist, was a familiar one, judged likely to have happened to many of the participants. The other event, having a nurse remove a skin sample from a little finger, was chosen to be implausible. In fact, the researchers went to the trouble of checking medical records to confirm that this procedure had never been conducted in the UK. Participants who had been asked to imagine the skin event were four times more likely to remember it happening to them than participants who had only been exposed to information about it. In addition to generating false memories, imagining events also made people more certain that the events had happened to them. The researchers concluded that merely imagining an event from childhood can produce false memories of it. Memory researchers have observed that advertisers make deft use of this phenomenon. To test this idea scientifically, researchers manipulated the vividness of imagery in adverts for a fictional new popcorn product. A week after participants had viewed these adverts, and some of them had actually got to try the product, they were tested on their memory. Those who had seen the high imagery adverts were as likely to say that they had tried the popcorn as those who actually did. These false memories were highly confident, and they were also associated with favourable ratings of the product. The popcorn wasn't just remembered, it was remembered fondly. This false experience effect, as it, as it has been termed, points to one way in which high imagery advertising can have its effects. Certain ads don't just succeed in making us feel we want to try something. They trick us into thinking that we have already done so.
Charles, thank you very, very much. Uh, you wrote a book about memory, but have clearly forgotten that I said I would wear this shirt. Uh, so, so the world... The world can now know that Dara shops at M&S. Yes. Is, is shop four at M&S. Uh, please. Let's retain some showbiz uh, kudos here. The, uh, by the way, apologies, I may have, uh, have to, I bet to pronounce your surname, I apologize, I may have, because I sipped on the, an Irish or English pronunci pronunciation. It sounded good. I Which think you sort of rushed it a bit at the end. I, wish, to, I to did, because well, hawk or haw, how do you pronounce it? Frenny Ho. Frenny Ho. The, uh, excuse me. The, uh, reading your book, I expected to read this to come out with a much more concrete view of what memory was, but very deliberately, I think, we get an image of memory as being a very tenuous, a very fallible thing, a very easily fooled mechanism that we have. Uh, you don't leave with a great deal of respect for memory and for narrative memory in particular, but how easily it's tricked. I don't think that's the case at all, actually. I think you come away, you certainly come away from reading the science with a view of memory as this extraordinary construction, this process of narrativizing, this process of meaning making that we're busy with throughout our lives. We're constantly shaping and reshaping our past in incredibly intricate and um, complex and subtle ways. And so I'd, what I don't want to do is say to people, your memories are all a load of junk. That's not the point at all. It's rather to say, if you look at how memory works, if you read some of the science and read about the wonderful ways in which writers and artists have written about memory, you gain a greater respect for it, I think. You start to understand why it lets you down in the ways that it does, but also why it has its amazing recombinative capacity, its, a, its ability to create itself anew constantly. So it's not about saying memories are a load of rubbish, that you should distrust them. It's about saying this is, this is what kind of thing a memory is and have a different relationship with your memory. And that's the way to continue to, to celebrate them, because they're the stories that we tell. They're the stories that we tell about our lives. But there are stories. I was talking to somebody earlier on who was worried about whether an early, early memory had a bit of what her mother had said in it, or a bit of a photograph that she'd seen. And I, I said, well, actually, does it matter? That's your story. That's your memory. Celebrate it. It doesn't make it any less valuable that it is created in this complex way. So memories in which, I mean, we go back within the book, there's a sequence of going back to the earliest memories. And some people's earliest memories are, they realise that they were actually seeing themselves within the memory, as it were. And that may be different to a memory that is from your own viewpoint. Yeah, so one of my early memories was, had the strange quality of being a third person memory. In other words, I could see myself sitting on the floor of the living room, pushing a toy across the floor. And, th and there's something weird about that. You know, if I'm processing information, if I'm taking stuff in through my eyes and my ears, when I replay that, I should have a first-person view of it. It should be, you know, like a, like a film where the camera's following the, the, the character. Some memories don't have that quality. And that suggests, in fact, suggested to Sigmund Freud, who noted this quite early on, that something has been switched, something has been reconstructed and recombined and rebuilt. And it's a very telling clue to the reconstructive nature of memory. I did, by the way, try to work out if I have a pet theory that you shouldn't really bother spending too much money on good family holidays until your kids are about four and a half, because they're not going to remember anyway. Uh, Absolutely. So it's literally, it's a, wasted it's, always, tri it's a wasted trip to Disneyland at three. Uh, it's, it's always been my policy. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, I was talking as well with you before, because it it's a thing that it, it becomes a very personal thing, because as you read your book, you also then compare it with your own experiences. The, uh, and you see the story, we were talking before, Johnny Wilkinson, who scored the winning mm. the kick for England in the 2003 World Cup, has never watched the match on a replay because he doesn't want the television version of it to replace his own memory of it. Mm. I mean, you, you in the book write about things that you held back from looking at, yeah. family mementos, until you could chart how it felt to look at these things. Yeah. So my dear sister Claire, who's in the audience, had prepared for me a collection of letters and documents that our auntie, who had recently passed away, had collected from our childhoods letters that we'd written to to her and her husband telling us what we've been doing. And this was such a precious, precious envelope to me. I didn't dare to open it until I was under the right conditions, until, you know, the, the, the kids were out of the house. Sorry, kids. But um, to, until I knew I had some peace and quiet, because I knew that reading one of those letters for the first time would be a different thing to reading it a second and a third and a fourth time. 
So I wanted to try and capture that moment. That would be like Johnny Wilkinson watching that video for the first time. And it was important because I was writing about memory. It was important to me to try and keep that moment of reconnecting with the past fresh. And I knew I hadn't seen these things since I was five years old because they'd been stashed away in my auntie's filing system and I just would not have seen them. So it was a very, you know, it was something that was reaching across the decades and I wanted to make sure I got it right. Is it a form of trauma to be given too much information to replace the, uh, the image you have in your head? You know, the, is, is, is there any situation in which that is a, a damaging thing to do? Yeah, I wouldn't call it trauma, I think. No, um, but... But it, I don't, it, you know, memory is constantly recombining. Memory is like a sponge sucking up bits of information that shouldn't actually be there in the memory. You know, we're constantly packing our memories full of stuff that actually, th that's, that belongs to another time, but we grab them and we put them in anyway. That's one reason why our memories have this changeable quality. So I think it's just a natural part of how memory works. You know, we're constantly um, finding different bits of information, but also our own feelings about the past change and our beliefs and our knowledge about the past change. And that reshapes our memory. It's quite hard to remember your feelings and, about things that happened to you in the past when so much has happened to you since. But in situations where memories are you know, are, are literally pitted against each other. For example, a court trial, um, that is a situation in which we have maybe invested too much in the concrete ability to remember things correctly. For sure. People are still being sent to their deaths in the United States on the basis of eyewitness testimony. And I find that outrageous. That there are changes in the legal system in this country and in the States that are devaluing eyewitness testimony as a source of evidence and it's now much more is recognized to be much more important that eyewitness testimony is corroborated in in different ways so things are changing we're getting a better view of memory because of the great work done by, by people like elizabeth loftus and dan schachter you know decades of really good research we're we're getting a different view of memory it's not filtered through to the general public, you know, a couple of American surveys recently found that, you know, 50% of people think that memory works like a video camera, which it totally doesn't. You know, memory is reconstructive rather than reproductive. But a lot of people still have that rather outdated views of how it works. Okay, so in other words, uh, it's more of a celebration of the subjective nature of memory rather than kind of a perceived idea that this is an objective record of everything that you've passed through. Yeah, you, you make these stories, but you make the stories the way that you do because you are who you are. So they're a celebration of the self in that sense. Lovely stuff. Thank you very, very much, Sharon. <laughs>to write a 21st century bestiary. Now, in the Middle Ages, say around 1300, people made books of beasts. And of course, most of their knowledge came from the Bible and also from text that, text that had survived from the ancient world, from Alexandria, uh, Greece, and Rome. And they were trying to, make a, trying to make sense of the world. They told stories using animals. They believed that the animals were allegorical. They illustrated a lesson in God's plan. And of course, we don't believe that now. Um, at least, I think probably many, many people in this room did not believe that, at least. Um, and so uh, we don't have the same sense of allegory, but we are still searching for meaning. So I've tried in a, set, in a way to, to make something approaching um, our own kind of bestiary. Um, and I guess one point I really wanted to, to communicate is, um, is that we should, be, we should be high on life. It's really, we should be celebrating just how astonishing it is, how extraordinary that... Uh, more than 500 million years of evolution has produced me, for example. I mean, that's pretty amazing. So, uh, <laughs> uh, um, and uh, I guess an another key point is that we live in a time of very rapid change. You may have heard the, the phrase the Anthropocene, a very rapid change in, in the Earth system, arising from a number of very significant human impacts, pollution, and the rest of it. 
And our future is, is very hard to predict, and it's probably unpredictable in many ways. Um, we may have life at the speed of light, as, as Craig Venter describes it. We may have all kinds of things, but we can't really know what, what we're going to find. Um, but after that kind of heavy reflection, I'm going to uh, just try and give you a sense of celebration from the book. I'm going to read two short passages. Um, the first one is just a list of names. Um, they're... Uh, a list, there are names of diatoms. This is a kind of plankton. They're a silicaceous, uh, photosynthesizing plankton. They're kind of beautiful. Um, and I hope the names at least give you a sense of some of their diversity and, uh, or if nothing else, the, the, uh, the strange imaginations that some taxonomist had when they made these names up. And the second passage following on from that is, um, is a quotation from Calvin, um, Italo Calvino, uh, the Italian writer who wrote a book called The Cosmic Comics back in the 1960s. Um, and uh, in one of the stories in that collection, um, it is set in, I guess, I think the Ordovician, it doesn't really matter, but a long time ago, uh, when the moon was a lot closer to the Earth than it is now and was moving much faster around the Earth, of course, and there were huge tides. In the story, um, people in the boat are rowing along and they're actually reaching up to the moon to get down things from the moon and somebody gets stuck up there and falls off back into the ocean. Um, so you get a sense of, of what he was trying to do. But anyway, first the diatoms. Take off these glasses. The swollen epitheme, the ant-like best back, the necklaced ladder wedge, the fat head congregant, the tufty table, the spiral curvy disc, the sharp sandal floret flank, the short-footed foam flower, the pot-bellied gravy boat, the noble feather jet, the greater coracle, Bidov's cutie, the all-seeing furrow disc, the crucial pocket compass, the star-bellied foot cord, the globe-stalked lawless dawn nymph. In Cosmic Comics, Italo Calvino imagined, imagines the rescue from the sea of a woman who remains encrusted in diatoms. We rode quickly to pull her out and save her. Her body had remained magnetized, and we had to work hard to scrape off all the things encrusted on her. Tender corals were wound around about her hair, and every time we ran a comb through her hair, there was a shower of crayfish and sardines. Her eyes were sealed shut by, limpet, shield, sealed shut by limpets, clinging to the lids with their suckers. Squid's tentacles were coiled around her arms and her neck, and her little dress now seemed woven only of weeds and sponges. We got the worst of it off her. But for weeks afterwards, she went on pulling out fins and shells, and her skin, dotted with little diatoms, remained, effect, remained affected forever, looking to someone who didn't observe her carefully, as if she were faintly dusted with freckles. That's it. Casper, it's a very beautiful book. It's probably the book, with respect to all of you, that has a, sort of a certain... Uh, scholarly element to which that it would be the one that would be best rewritten by monks uh, if it was ever to be transcribed and, and, and illustrated. I mean, like obviously the design of it was very, very important as well. I mean, that's a deliberate nod to a particular era of, of book. Well, it is. I mean, uh, I mentioned the bestries of the Middle Ages. There's, um, they, were, they were really flourished in France and England around 1300, what we call the High Middle Ages before the Black Death. But uh, some of the inspirations go further back. There's a, a famous, to some people, perhaps to you, an old Irish poem called Panga Ban, which was written in the margins of a text, around, I think around the 800 or 900, describes, describes the, the monk <laughs> interacting with his, his cat, and uh, the cat maybe being smarter than the monk, and that's a theme you find in Montaigne and elsewhere. And um, uh, in Christopher Smart, the, the insane English poet of the 18th century, this fascination with animals. So, so it has all these kind of um, inspirations. And, uh, but I have to say, as if written by monks, that has to go on the next edition. If there is a next edition, or should, <laughs> it should be rewritten by monks. That should would be, well, I'm, I'm, see, again, it's in the Irish. <laughs> I, 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 we had to learn Panger Ball in school, I'm delighted to say. Uh, so I'm well familiar. But with some gold leaf illustrations of the first letter, mm. it, it, it does merit, it's digressionary. Uh, it, it, and it feels like uh, you know, you've, uh, everything is within this all possible. Like, I mean, and it, it, they're all real creatures, obviously, in this. Rather than being a fictional bestiary, they are genuine animals from A to Z. You have all unusual animals drawn in from nature. 
They're all real animals. They, uh, in medieval bestiaries, you have unicorns and manticores and all kinds of bizarre beasts that people believed existed. Sometimes that's a kind of slightly distorted um, report, it's gone through many, ma many mouths and ears and produced something strange. But, so, but bestiaries also contained real animals, and people believed they were all real. These animals are all real. Um, they're all extant, except for one. Um, and the point there was that uh, I'm trying to say that the, the real world is, is more extraordinary than most of the things that humans have imagined. So there's another inspiration for the book is, is the Book of Imaginary Beings by Borges, the Argentine writer. Um, and that's a compendium of myth. But the, the point here is that, uh, that the real world, if once you start to pay attention, it is, is infinitely beautiful, if indefinitely beautiful all the way down um, to the very, very basis of, of what makes life, and virally, at the cellular level, uh, at every level, and, and in our cultures too. And within this A to Z, from the axolotl to the zebrafish, you also carry, you, you celebrate our role, with, our place within evolution, and our place within this changing environment that, and the changes we are making to this environment. Yeah, um, I mean, it is a book of celebration, but there is this kind of uh, heavy, uh, gloomy environmental subtext. You know, I've I'm a, I'm a, been writing about environmental issues, and it's very hard to write about those issues, perhaps, at least for some of us, to either write or read about them without getting very concerned. You know, there are, there are huge and rapid changes in the Earth system. I've mentioned, you know, we, we, we're familiar with... Um, everybody probably is familiar with the debates around climate change. And I think one of the things we, we don't often really take inside and, and reflect on, because if we did, it might actually change our behavior more than it does, is how momentous and how the, the sheer enormity of those changes. Um, and they're one of the things we really need. We need to celebrate, and we can celebrate as well as being concerned, and I would hope active in, in trying to uh, make some changes. Which is your favorite of the animals? Everybody asks that. I, I do like them all. I have to say tonight, because um, just to annoy Sean Carroll, that uh, the octopus is my favourite tonight, because I, I think we shouldn't be eating them, because they're quite, they're quite intelligent animals, and uh, they are truly remarkable and um, uh, astonishingly sophisticated in their communication. I, of course, I don't hold anything against you for eating one, but uh, they are... So octopuses, so for example, they, they can communicate um, using the, um, I think they're chromatophores on their skin to produce very, very rapid changes in hue and texture. And there might be some very sophisticated communication going on there that we don't fully appreciate. And, and indeed, that might be one of the things that people are able to harness in future. We'll be able to communicate in new ways with the kinds of technologies and uh, directions we're taking with, um, with virtual reality and other technologies. And under H, why did we make the cut? Uh, because, <laughs> um, because humans are animals, and um, I, it seemed like a challenge. I wanted to say something about humans, and I wanted... Um, a friend of mine said I let humans off much too lightly, given some of the things I've just been saying. I've been much too kind to humans, but I'm a human, and I want to be kind to others. So um, I wanted to just take a look at us, in a sense, as, as if we're animals, look at some of the roots of our nature, of course, we're enormously complex, and our, our current uh, states are being mediated by thousands of years of culture, but we have some very deep biological roots, obviously, um, and the ones I chose to uh, focus on are um, just the fact that we, we are on two legs most of the time, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that we have music, which is a great evolutionary puzzle. Does it have adaptive value? Is it a kind of, is it a technology? But it's some, one of the things that really... Um, is remarkable about us, not necessarily unique, but it's certainly very remarkable and very beautiful and wonderful, and I wanted to write about it. Okay, well, thank you very much, Casper. Mm. Mm. The range of references in Casper's works is so broad, I think it also includes the final book that we're going to mention here. I think it actually gets, it does get a mention, actually, yeah. Uh, the final author is a professor of marine conservation at the University of York. His previous book, The Unnatural History of the Sea, won the Rachel Carson Environment Book Prize and was one of the Washington Post's 10 best books of 2007. The book is The Ocean of Life, and it's by Callum Roberts. so looking forward to seeing that <laughs> little video introduction. The, the creative uh, minds have been uh, really working in overdrive there. So I wrote The Ocean of Life really uh, because I wanted to answer a question that was continuously put to me after my first book, The Unnatural History of the Sea, and 
That was really a, an exploration of the effects of a thousand years of fishing and hunting on the oceans. And so people would ask me time and again, what's the biggest impact that people are having on the sea? You know, fishing is one thing, but what about oil spills or sewage or climate change or ocean acidification or, or any one of these sorts of things that they were interested in? And I, I couldn't honestly answer that, you know, how big is a, uh, it, whatever. It, it was impossible. And so I wrote the book really to try and look at all of the different dimensions of human influence on the oceans and to put them all together, not to, to be able to rank them. And in fact, that became an impossible task. What was clear was that the, the, they all work together in very strange and uh, difficult to explain ways. And it's the cumulative collective impact which is the most interesting and the one that we uh, need to get to grips with the most. Now, um, what was a, a conclusion which just kind of jumped out at me towards the end of writing this is that the oceans are changing in more ways uh, and faster than at any time in human history. Uh, and we're experiencing this kind of roller coaster ride of change. And, and uh, towards the end of the book, I, I started thinking about how it must be for something which is, gets really old. What, what would it have felt about the changes that it's experienced in its lifetime? And so I'm, I'm going to read a little piece from the epilogue called The Sea Ahead about one such creature. A few years ago, a Nupiat hunters from the north slope of Alaska caught a bowhead whale. When they cut up its carcass, they found an iron harpoon point buried within its shoulder of a kind that had not been used for more than 100 years. It turned out that this whale was 130 years old. Other older bowheads have been caught with stone harpoon points in them, which indicate that these animals can live for 200 years. I wonder what a 200-year-old whale would make of the changes it has experienced in its lifetime. In the early 19th century, there were perhaps as many as 100,000 bowheads around the Bering Strait that separates North America from Asia. The sea would have resounded to their calls as they went about the noisy business of life. For more than half of the year, much of their world was frozen. Then, in 1848, a whaling boat penetrated these waters and slaughtered them like sheep. The bowhead is a docile creature and killing was easy. A year later, their southern grounds exhausted, more than 150 other whaling vessels did the same. In the space of a couple of decades, bowhead numbers were slashed. For every 100 whales before, only one or two were left, and the whale chorus fell silent. 100 years on, those seas began to fill with the noise of ships, and then in 1984, the world called off its commercial hunt. By then, the bowhead seas were pierced with a new sound, the deafening thump of seismic exploration for oil and gas. Sea ice retreated, and unfamiliar fish and plankton began to move north. Over long years, ever so slowly, the number of bowhead whales began to recover. Now there are over 10,000 in Alaskan waters, and their lowing calls once again fill the seas, although this time in competition with the roar of ships' engines. Within the space of a single bowhead lifetime, the world of whales changed forever. I'm just going to fast forward to the last paragraph of my book, which kind of sums up the feeling going, going forward. Some of the backstory in this book is disheartening, and the picture gets worse looking forward if we blithely continue on our present course. But I'm hugely encouraged by efforts in the last 10 years. People have noticed the spread of human influence across the sea and beneath it, and there are countless efforts underway to redress the harm. I've never seen so much energy or commitment to tackle problems from the humblest village to the debating halls of the United Nations. This is why I remain an optimist. We can change. We can turn around our impacts on the biosphere. We can live alongside wild nature. The alternative is self-destruction. First of all, it's a terrible sales technique to give away the ending. Uh, <laughs> the, the book, however, does have, probably more clearly than maybe the other ones here, Casper does uh, touch on this, perhaps with the, a campaigning side to it. It is, a, it is a, a call to arms to a certain extent because the title Ocean of Life, there may become a point where that becomes an ironic title. I mean, how much damage is being done or has been done by humans to the oceans? 
I think the answer is a huge amount of damage and the, the rate at which we are impacting the sea is speeding up and that's why uh, we face a, prob a point in our lives where we need to react to those changes very, very quickly. But it's not impossible to do that, uh, I think. And the many things that we, we can do, which are fairly straightforward, would make a big difference to the ability of the oceans to cope with the kind of changes that we're exerting on this planet. Um, and it, in a way, you, know, you can sum up the, the, the solution to the problems in a single sentence, and that is that we, we need to protect more, we need to fish less using less destructive methods, we need to waste less, pollute less, pollute less. And uh, if we were to practice that, then the ocean life would be rebuilt uh, to a level which is much more productive than it is today. So fishing less actually means catching more. Uh, it's a simple equation. Uh, and so the solutions are straightforward. Implementing is the hard part. And uh, I, I uh, have now turned to writing a, another book about, you know, what do we do about it? Because people now ask me, you know, are we ever going to solve the problems, the fix that we've got ourselves into? And the answer is not with the present way of governing the planet. We, we uh, instead of rising to the challenge of planetary governance, um, of uh, cooperating at an international scale, we seem just at the point where we need it most to have uh, ground to a halt. And um, international negotiations over all sorts of things from trade to climate change are, uh, are just running into deep sand. And I, I, I want to know why that is. And so, so that's where I'm, I'm moving now with the next bit of thinking. And uh, why is it that we have not? Is this the presumption that the ocean is somehow infinite and huge and can therefore take this small amount of, if I make a small mess here, that it should there's so much ocean there, it can handle it? Have we just deluded ourselves into that until uh, now? Well, I think we, we've reached what I'd call the uh, uh, humanity's King Canute moment. Uh, and King Canute <laughs> commanded his throne to be placed on the, on the beach about a thousand years ago. and, and uh, with the intention of uh, commanding the tide to stop. But of course, the tide didn't stop. And uh, thereby, he demonstrated that even kings are uh, subservient to a greater power. And um, we, we have, we're, we're not capable of altering the course of nature. Well, uh, we have reached the point where humanity is a global influence and can alter the course of nature even of the largest system out there, which is the oceans. They occupy something like 95% of the living space on this planet. And because of that immensity, we, we have simply taken them for granted. Uh, when I was writing the book, I, I was talking to somebody about it, and, and she summed it up beautifully, I think, in that uh, she said, yes, we, we're used to taking things out of the ocean that we've never seen before and putting things into the ocean that we never want to see again. Unfortunately, on the latter score, we, we are now beginning to see it with alarming regularity. There's two benchmarks you have in the book. One is a photograph of marlin fishermen or, or sport fishermen in Florida, is it? The, uh, photo That's right. Uh, uh, the, there's a series of photographs that were taken at Key West Dock uh, in Florida over a period of five decades. Uh, and so if you go to the 1950s, there are these pictures uh, which, which look like a scene from The Wizard of Oz, but with fish. I mean, there's this, uh, you know, a, a smiling couple and a, a little girl, and, and she's holding a dog, and behind them, huge groupers, just this wall of groupers. And there are other photographs showing sharks and all sorts of things. And then you fast forward to the 1980s, and, and there are heaps of fish, this time on the ground, all over the place. Uh, and this time, the, the fish are about this size. There's still masses of them. It must have been the most extraordinary day out that you could think of. And, and then we come to the noughties, and uh, there's this rather miserable plank of wood with uh, a, a few small fish and a tiny little juvenile shark. And, uh, and the thing that hasn't changed, the one constant throughout all of this, is that the anglers have had a great day, although perhaps in the more, more recent decades, uh, beer has played a larger role in the day <laughs> yeah. than in the earlier decades when they spent all of their time working to pull these fish out. So the anglers have the same size grin on their face, but have caught progressively smaller fish in the last century. It's That's right. that noticeable yeah. a difference. In it. And the other one, which is quite shocking, you have a, you have a map of the world, because we've heard of this sea of floating plastic in the Pacific, mm. but that is only one of how many of these 
gyres? How many of these rotations? There are something like 11 gyres across the planet, which are, which are busy concentrating floating stuff. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, the currents uh, rotate in a clockwise direction. In the southern hemisphere, they're anti-clockwise. And, and because of the Coriolis force uh, from the rotation of the planet, that means that the, the currents all around these gyres are pushing inwards. And so they heap up the water in the middle, and it, it, it essentially is uh, flowing down a giant plug hole towards the, the depths. And all the floating stuff concentrates at the surface. And what we're finding is, of course, huge quantities of plastic in these systems. And I think the most telling demonstration of what we have done is from the North Pacific, where the Laysan albatross nests on incredibly remote Pacific atolls. And uh, they fly thousands of miles across empty empty sea, plucking food from the surface for their chicks. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, their evolution has not prepared them for the task of distinguishing between plastic and food. And so they bring back all this plastic and feed their chicks on a junk food diet. And the chicks die. And then as the body rots away, they leave this, these little shrines of plastic pieces of bottle caps, ballpoint pens, and uh, uh, little plastic dinosaurs and so forth that have been drifting across the ocean for, for many years. It's, it's a horrible thought. Can this be solved? Well, it can. I, I mean, the plastic problem could be solved by some concerted effort to clean it up. I think uh, it would be possible to design methods of removing the plastic, which would be in, done in a timely manner. And, and with a relatively small fleet of boats, you could probably remove things down to the size of a bottle cap, which is about the size that really matters for, for albatrosses. Um, and uh, uh, you, could, you could skim the sea in, in maybe five years with a few hundred ships. There's a good reason for us wanting to do that, because it's not about albatrosses, ultimately. It's about ourselves. And as the plastic breaks down, it, it acts as an attractant it, with a bigger and bigger surface area for lots of toxic chemicals. And then once, once your plastic fragments become small enough that they can be eaten by little fish or plankton, uh, then they get passed up the food chain uh, and into the flesh of things that we really like to eat, like uh, tuna. And um, so you know, the next time you're, you're uh, choosing your sushi, you might want to give that a second thought as to how much uh, in the way of toxins have built up in that delicious, succulent-looking <laughs> piece of tuna. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Callum. Uh, very good. <laughs> Although actually, while giving you that applause, I do want to stay with you because I want to broaden the discussion out into how you write this kind of book for a general audience. And one of the things, the, the pitfalls into which you, you might fall into this. Callum, it could be very easy for a book like this to become hectoring, to become preachy in some way. You've avoided that in the book, but was that, were you aware of, of having to do that, having to be careful not to do that? Well, I don't want to be judgmental in it. And uh, I called it Ocean of Life because the, the, the sea is obviously full of life, but it's also life-sustaining at a planetary level. And I wanted to celebrate that. I wanted it not to be a gloom and doom book all about how we're going to go to hell and everyone's going to die. I mean, we know everyone's going to die anyway, but uh, that, that isn't something that would make somebody want to buy a book about the oceans. And so really, uh, I wanted to put forward, first of all, my, my love for the sea and the things that live in it and to show that there is, there is hope and there is a way forward. We, we can get out of the difficulties that we've inadvertently got ourselves into. Nobody deliberately set out to destroy the planet. Um, but little by little, we're altering the planet in ways that threaten our own survival. And, and, but I don't want that to dominate. I want it to be something that you would, you know, you might buy somebody for Christmas, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and equally, Casper, it's, it's a subtext from what you've written as well. But I suppose you have to face the same problems of it not being hectoring, it not being, you know, preachy. Yeah, no, I'll leave that to somebody else. Uh, I mean, I've tried it and it doesn't seem to work very well, so... <laughs> I mean, there are, there's, there's lots, well, I could go further on that. I mean, there are times when hectoring and getting angry and in an organized and nonviolent way is very important. Um, but there are times also when you need to realize what's at stake. I think that's the real issue. Um, that's very hard to get on board. And it's a scary thought. It's a difficult thought. Um, and so we need to be well prepared for that. And we need, you know, it's, it, it's also easy to get into a condition of learned helplessness, you know, of, of, uh, or just you know, turning off, turning off. So you need to really think about how you approach these kind of questions. 
I mean, it is a, a, a challenge you, that you all have in terms of how you calibrate the technical knowledge within this. I mean, possibly the obvious example is, is, is something which is obviously incredibly specific and technical that you're dealing with. I mean, it is always the thing about uh, the correct analogy, the correct metaphor. They, uh, I mean, is that, is that a struggle to find the right word? It's absolutely a struggle because you're translating, right? I mean, the uh, theories are written down in math, uh, in equations and so forth, and with using words that are borrowed from English but use it in a specialized way. And the confrontation with the data over the last several hundred years has forced us to come up with theories that make no intuitive sense to us whatsoever. Relativity, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and beyond. And so, uh, Absent, you know, people spending uh, 10 years of their lives learning the math, we're going to have to translate it into English using analogies, using, um, you know, we talk about particles moving through molasses, we talk about Margaret Thatcher moving through a party of, uh, of, of people, and we hope that some of that gets through, but of course, the analogies are not perfect. And sadly, the people listening to the analogy sometimes think they should take them seriously and then go, oh, that implies this, and you have to go, oh, no, I didn't really mean that. Yeah. So that's definitely part of the effort. I mean, does the same thing apply if you anthropomorphize things? Uh, you have to be very careful. I tried to walk a bit of a tightrope there. I didn't want, especially when you're talking about emotion, uh, I didn't want people to think that I was anthropomorphizing. And you get the full gamut amongst people that write about these things. As I say, you know, some people that think that birds have uh, all the feelings that we have and some that think that they're just machines. I mean, the, when I was talking to you, I mean, the, the impression was there. Certain birds have emphasis on, on certain um, uh, senses. It's not like they're, they have the same five sense. A homunculus of their sensory intake wouldn't be the same. Or they don't have the same rainbow of senses, as it were. There, some focus on some, some focus on others. There the are 10,000 species of birds. They live in just about every environment on Earth. Mm -hmm and they're subject to all sorts of different selection pressures, so it's hardly surprising that they use different sets of senses according to the lifestyle that they lead. So the oil bird lives in South America, feeds on fruit, nests in completely dark ca caves, and is one of the only a handful of birds that can echolocate. And it also has a very good sense of smell, so it echolocates in its cave, comes out at night looking for fruit, and smells it, and flies off across the forest. Now, for yourself and for yourself, there are, there are two separate challenges in terms of how you balance the work. You were using narrative a lot of the time, a subjective experience you have balancing off, and then you would refer that back to the processes of the brain. I mean, that, that's a, that's a, there are deliberate choices to be made of how much technical detail. How did you filter that, or how did you choose how to calibrate that? Well, I think with any kind of writing, you've got to strike a balance between opposing um, demands. You know, in fiction, for example, you've got to strike a balance between showing and, and telling. You've got to take into account what the author can, uh, what the reader can make up for their for them, so, uh, make up their own minds for their own, um, and you know, balance that with what you're telling them. Um, so for me, it was quite easy that I was writing about memories, which everybody has, but I wanted to bring in the technical information, uh, make it so that it wasn't just about the brain. It's not just about the brain. Memory works at uh, neural levels, but it also works at cognitive levels, at personal levels, at social levels, and cultural levels. And all of these things need to be uh, brought together. Um, so, but it was just about striking a balance. It was just about f trying to find a voice that allowed you to pull those different things together in, into a form that um, was satisfying to the reader. And Enrico, throughout your book, it's, uh, you've given many examples of classical art. It's an excellent, it's an excellent book on art history, uh, by the way, amidst all of the other big ideas. The, uh, but were you worried that that might get in the way or that it may not illustrate the points you wanted to make? Well, I was just listening, actually, to the conversation on this issue of analogy and, um, and the way people worry that if you're giving an analogy, you're not telling them how it really is. Are you just giving this analogy, but the, what, what's it really like? And the interesting thing about science is it's actually, it's fully, it's permeated by analogies. It's permeated by metaphors, professional science, okay? If you take, for example, the word like cell, okay? You have biological cells. Well, cell was, was an analogy with a monk's cell or a hermit's cell. That was how it was originally coined, all right? Or if you take things like physics, you know, is it a part, like a particle or is it like a wave? So it's not that analogies are not part of science. They are part of science. But sometimes analogies become sort of absorbed into the sort of mindset of people. They cease to be analogies. They become, as it were, part of the sort of technical language. Mm -hmm. And they lose that element. But if you're trying to come to grips with something, at the end of the day, you're trying to say, well, what, what is it like? What is, what's the nearest thing it could be like to? How can I get my head around this? And that's true whether you're a scientist or whether you're popularizing science. It's just as a strange 
sort of caricature of science, there's this real stuff that is not analogy, that's how the world really is, and then there's this other stuff that we try and make analogies near about. And to my mind, science is, is full of trying to think of how we can think about this in terms of something else. Well, by, by its nature, it's a it can be a reductive process. Mm -hmm. You can be looking for the salient features of a system. This may be, um, I have a more physicist training, I suppose, than, than, than anything else. But you tend to look for the qualities of a feature, and then you create a mathematical structure in physics that will repeat some of that behavior. But the, uh, so I'm intrigued to know that that applies as well in, in, the, in the life sciences as well. That it, it's, just, it's not just an a, a, a tool for explanation. It is also a way in which you further your knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do people ever respond, however, correcting your analogy and saying... And, and well, yeah, the problem is sometimes that they think that you're dumbing down by using an analogy. And, that, and actually, the question is, how do you evaluate whether it's a good analogy or not? And sometimes you need the technical knowledge to appreciate that something really is a spot-on analogy. And sometimes it's difficult to, con to convey. Who's maybe somebody who's not an expert, they might think, well, that's, that just sounds like it's dumbing down or it's telling me something that... You're just telling me that, because, but actually it may be something that goes very deep in terms of, of recognising some, some similarity. But of course, people that have a more technical background may appreciate the analogy sometimes more than, than the non-technical person. He's, oh yes, I see how that actually can be represented in that way. So analogies have this very curious sort of ap differential appeal to different people. Are there any other problems that you, you feel in terms of writing a book for a general audience? I think if you have experience of, as a teacher of undergraduates, mm. that's the very best sounding board of whether they get your analogy or your facts right. Mm -hmm. And for me, I just think writing popular science is an extension of teaching undergraduates. You're just teaching a broader audience. Well, that seems a good level to, to pitch it at, as Jason said. We have microphones in the room, I know, if anyone wants to ask any questions, if you could raise your hand and then we could, uh, we could get to you. Does anyone want to ask a question either specifically or generally to the panel? There's one right at the back. You really have beaten them into submission. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, there's one right at the very back there. We've got a microphone there. Hi. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, thank you very much for that. That was very fascinating. Um, my question comes from uh, my career, which is uh, I'm a museum curator, and one of our biggest challenges is communicating specialist information to non-specialist audiences. One of the tools that we tend not to use, wrongly, in my opinion, is humour. So I was just wondering, at the risk of starting a fight among the panel, um, but how do you feel humour is as a technique for communication when it comes to the kind of things you're talking about? And this would presumably apply to jokes you've written yourself rather than stolen from comics who live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was really, really trying to avoid that, but yeah, saying, go ahead. Just saying, I didn't plan to in the audience to ask that question, <laughs> but she's raised the issue, Sean. It's not going away. Uh, does it work? Does it distract? No, it works. It works for you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that we... we it, it, I shouldn't say struggle, but one of the things about teaching science or explaining science or communicating science is that we do think that there is a nugget of truth that we'd like to get across. And you can be correct about the truth or incorrect about the truth. And sometimes that can lead to a certain ponderousness uh, you know, or didacticism. And using humor is absolutely cu crucial. Using humor, using uh, literary techniques, storytelling, because the scientists are, are in it. You know, it's not for the fame and fortune. Right? It's because we love this stuff that we're doing. And getting that across and the enjoyment of it and the passion is absolutely central to the whole enterprise. Come. Maybe it's just my bad humor, but uh, I, when I sent my manuscript off to, to my editor in America, it usually came back with red lines through the, <laughs> through the things I thought were funny. And, <laughs> <laughs> and because I was sure of my, my good uh, taste in humor, I, I, I put them all back in. And, uh, and this carried on for a while, toing and froing, until eventually they were in the book <laughs> which came out. And for better or worse, the humor is there. And I, I find that the, the, the one thing which is really great when you're talking to students is to use humor throughout your lectures because uh, learning's got to be fun. Science is fun. And um, it, it, you know, otherwise, you've got to levitate some of the, the gloom and doom aspects of the environmental stories that you're telling. And, uh, and that can be done quite easily, I think. I think there's another sort of more general point about humor, which is why does humor work? Okay, so humor works because you're sort of drawing the audience along in a certain way. And you say, actually, look at it this way. Okay, but the, there's a twist, all right? There's a turn. And it's getting people to see things in a slightly different way. Well, we heard some examples of the, like the breeding behavior of certain birds. It's humorous because you say, oh, you, know, you didn't expect the bird to be like that. 
And so in the more general sense, in communicating science, as in lots of communication, what you want to do is to give that twist. Because it's through that jolt that people say, ah, yes, that, that's, that's, what, that, that's interesting. That grabs the attention. So that's, more, that's not just humour in terms of sort of uh, a joke or something that's sort of, uh, uh, sort of going to make you laugh explicitly, but it's humour in the sense of getting people to, to get that jolt to see, yes, ah, now I see something that I didn't see from a certain perspective. And well, I think an that's extension of that, I mean, giving a lecture or a talk is, a, a, is an extension of writing. And I took all my cues on how to lecture from watching comedians because timing in terms of the humour is absolutely crucial. And when I'm trying to train my PhD students, it's hard work. They just kind of don't get it. You know, I'm just going to whack up another PowerPoint slide with all the text on and you can read it. And I go, that's rubbish. Don't do that. You think like a comedian. Think like Dara. You, know, well, you can do this. Don't, 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 that's not <laughs> the message like to take from this at all. I, I'd, like, I'd like to add one thing, a really totally humorless point, but it, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is probably the human situation is profoundly ironic and you might as well go for comic irony rather than tragic irony, although we probably need both. <laughs> we, we have found, sorry, just in, in the shows we've done, we, we do a, a second show to Stargazing Live, um, which is called Back to Earth, just, which is just scientists sitting around. We do a, a later part of, uh, of Science Club, which is just a scientist sitting around. And if you get four scientists sitting around talking with passion about stuff, it just you end up finding things that are funny within it, a very naturally and very, in a very ordinary way and not in a very contrived way, because, you know, as in the rule, you're generally very interested, passionate people who know things about your subject and the conversation just tends to be quite interesting and entertaining as a thing. And that is amazingly surprising to people who'd like to think of you all in white coats, uh, just speaking ponderously about stuff. Yes, I think, I think it's enormously useful for, for explaining. And you're, yes, yourself there at the front. There, we may need the... Uh, let's get a microphone to you there. Yes, we'll get, we'll get a mic to you. Thank you. There was a brilliant moment last week in Jim Alcalini's program, uh, Light and Dark, where he actually uh, wrote some equations down on a, on a blackboard. And Dara, you write equations in the School of Hard, hard Sums, but I wonder from the authors uh, whether you came under any pressure from your publishers not to include that level of technical detail in your books. Graphs, equations, sums, all of that, obviously, that, that would have, there's plenty you could... Yeah, I think that I avoided equations in this book. My previous book did have three equations, and there's a parlor game to guess which three equations I put in. But you know, you can treat the equations as little works of art, right? Little bits of concrete poetry, and you can explain what all the terms mean. And I think that that shouldn't be completely avoided when it, when it is helpful. But what I did get was the graphs in this book. I had two graphs, which were the actual PowerPoint slides that were shown on July 4th, 2012, when they discovered, the, when they announced the discovery of the Higgs boson. And, you know, there were error bars and, and little dots with little lines, and it got a little, and my, my editor said, you know, everything else is great, but that might be a little too sciencey for the audience. <laughs> and I said, you know, we paid $9 billion for these plots. <laughs> They're going in the book. They went in. I, I know that you have, you have various diagrams of the brain uh, within, within your book as well. The, uh... well. There's one diagram of the brain which does the, did all the work I thought was needed to be done in terms of diagrams. And it's partly, as a writer, your instinct is to make the words work, you make the words paint the picture. But also, also I felt if I'd overdone the diagrams, they would probably have been about the brain. And that tends to privilege the brain. To, it, tends to, you know, it creates the impression that you're saying it's all about how, what's going on in the brain. And it's not, for reasons I've, I've mentioned. There's other things going on as well. <coughs> So it seemed to me that I had just enough diagrams in the book, and that was one. And Enrico, you, 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 however, have various arguments about cells and receptors, and were you worried that that would, that, that would look too technical? Um, I wasn't worried that it would... I mean, there is obviously a sense in which things may look too technical. But at the end of the day, images, I mean, can speak for themselves in a way that words... you. you you might work very hard to say something that an image just tells you straight away. There's also paintings and things like that in my book. Mm. So again, I didn't, I mean, I, I totally respect people that just write a book with no, no images and you can write, you know, wonderful science books without having any images whatsoever. And there it's all in the words and the logic. But sometimes images, if you've got a, a particular topic and you don't use images, it's almost perverse because the, the images can tell so much more. It's a bit like the equation, what you were saying about an equation. An equation, if you understand it, can represent in a very economical way an idea or a relationship. Um, and to, to deny yourself 
um, that at the expense of a, of a worry that when somebody flicks through this, oh, that looks like a bit of a, a bit of a dangerous image, sort of sciencey image. I, th I think that's probably a wrong call in some cases. In some cases, maybe if the words and the subject matter lend themselves to it, then then doing without images is absolutely fine. I had to organise something in our department it was to celebrate 100 years of the university, and I sat through and listened to seven of my colleagues give talks. And they all wanted to use heavy PowerPoint with equations. And I just said, use pictures. No words, no equations, no numbers. And it was a real battle. Some people got it straight away and did it and went, yeah, this works. Other people, you know, seven times in, you know, they're still <coughs> fighting for their correlation or their regression. No, you don't need it. And I think, you know, an image is incredibly powerful. And often, without any words at all, you can do exactly as you say. It works fabulously. There's a, a colleague of mine on, on Science Club called Mark Miodovnik who wrote an excellent book about materials this year. And it was 10 or 11 chapters focusing on one on steel, one on chocolate, one on various different things. But he said that is, he did quietly go to the publisher and go, is there any chance I could also write, as an accompaniment, the technical version of this book? I'd just like to write a book which had all of these, but properly, no concession to anything at all. Were you tempted to or any of these books that you, you may have published on the, all of this anyway? But we tempted just to let yourself put what you wanted, like th that, that you'd be allowed print in tandem with this. I think as a, as a scientist, you kind of, you've got this terrible urge exactly. to do that, and you have to take your editor's advice. <laughs> um, so uh, my plan was to put a lot of technical drawings on the web, and then when the book seemed to be doing it okay, I thought, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Fine. <laughs> so there's a sense, actually, there's a sort of discipline of not doing it as well, which is actually positive, because if you have the, the restraint that you say, like, I'm going to limit myself from the extent to how technical I'm going to be. It forces you to express your ideas in a clearer way. Because sometimes you hide behind. I mean, it's too easy to say, oh, yeah, I'll just use that image. And then you hide behind the image rather than actually, because it, rather than saying, no, how would I really get to, to nail this thing in a way that really explains what I'm, what I'm doing? So then actually, that's what I find very nice about writing popular science. It's not just that um, you're, you're, it's not the frustration of not being able to say everything. It's the discipline of saying, I'm only going to extract the, real, the things that matter most. And, that, and so in that sense, actually, not being able to put complicated things there is actually a, a great benefit. Fantastic. I think we can go to one more question from those before we uh, get to the important business we have to do. Is there any more questions there? If not... Oh, oh wait, at the back, at the back there. Yes, sir, at the back. Thank you. Um, I think all the authors have been writing about their own fields. Um, do you think there might be something about um, extending your fields and writing about um, other topics that you're not quite so uh, technically proficient in? And uh, yeah, thank you. Tim, I'm going to do first. I think that uh, bird sense was way outside my field. I mean, I've studied birds all my life, um, but the thing that fascinated me about this is that. None of my ornithological colleagues knew anything about what was in that book. They just said, we learned something every few lines. And I kind of went out and researched all that area and combined it with my own knowledge to put my own kind of perspective on it. But for me, every time I write a book, is like, write, like doing a new degree. So it's really just taking it out of yourself. It's a learning process, a very enriching process for yourself. It's not a self-indulgent process. No, no, no. It's, and it's not just a pressy of all of your, of your academic work that you're doing. Not at all. No. Yeah, I mean, certainly my book is not about my field. Okay, so I'm a plant biologist, and most of the, most of the, 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 the biggest section is actually on neuroscience. Okay, so plant neuroscience is a very small area. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I had to learn all that, all, all about neuroscience for, to write this book. And, uh, and also computational neuroscience. So it's not the case. It's interesting that, it's, that, that it was an interesting question because maybe that is the way people perceive things, that, that we're all writing about our own stuff. But as soon as you enter a more general dialogue, you're forced to go into things that are not your territory. And actually, that's one of the exciting things, as, as Tim was saying, about writing a book, that you suddenly think, heck, heck I've got to really figure, figure all this other stuff out, um, and rather than being comfortable in your own area. So. So, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Well, either you, um, I, I wasn't really writing in my own field at all with memory. I'm, not, I'm a developmental psychologist by training, and um, the field of cognitive psychology is not my, wasn't my area of strength. And I actually think you're better at teaching and communicating a topic where you're not an expert. I don't think I teach my own stuff as well as I teach other stuff, because you know too much, and you, you're not aware of the things that you take for granted that other people don't take for granted. So it's very interesting for me. I sort of had the skills as a research 
scientist to know how to process the information and how to tell a story about it. But it wasn't one that there wasn't a body of knowledge that I was particularly familiar with at the start. Like, like many of the people up here, I, I, I didn't feel I was writing about my own field. I mean, a little piece of my book is about my own field. But after I uh, had um, published my first book, I was contacted by somebody who asked me, uh, because they liked the way I wrote, if I could uh, write a popular version of their multi-author academic work on, uh, on fresh water and sanitation. <laughs> and, uh, there, are, there are lines that you should... <laughs> <laughs> and Casper, of course, you're a, you're, you're a general science writer. The, uh, it's a, is, do you have a particular... I, I knew nothing about anything I was writing about. <laughs> <laughs> it took a long time. But it's a great process, if you like, uh, to be it, a lot of pain and to become impoverished because you're spending so much time on something that's not lucrative. But it is, life is short, and you discover so much, you learn so much. It's really, it's wonderful to do. And, um, you know, you expand your passion, you expand your world. And I, I would recommend writing a book about something you don't know anything about. And, and I'd, I'd like to just add um, to, to Casper's comment there. We've been very much focusing on the idea of science writing as getting information out of our heads and getting it out there into your heads, you know, the transmission of knowledge, which is a really important part of science writing. We wouldn't be doing our jobs if we weren't doing that to some extent. But there's an, at least one other level on which science writing, any writing, works, and that is the creation of new meanings. You know, you're creating a story, you're putting things together in a way that is satisfying, that makes people think about things in a different way. So Casper's book, for example, you know, if a Martian read that book and said, so there are 26 organisms on your planet and they're arranged in alphabetical order. <laughs> no, what Casper's done, he, he's taken some different bits of information and put them together to make a beautiful thing. And that's what great science writing can do. It can convey information in an accessible, uh, um, digestible way but it creates new meanings as well. We're going to leave it at that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we get to the, um, the announcement of, of who's the winner, could we give a round of applause to all six of our authors? So, <laughs> gentlemen, I'm going to let you return to your seats. Now I'm going to let them return to their chairs uh, with the note that we are already running 25 minutes over. Sorry about that, but there's really, that could have gone on for much longer. Uh, could we please welcome, however, with the important business of the evening, uh, the founder and chairman of Winton Capital Management, David Harding, and president of the Royal Society, Sir Paul Nurse. Thank you very much, Dara. It just falls to me, um, on behalf of Winter Capital, to thank everybody who's made um, this prize possible and our sponsorship of it possible. Thank you very much to the, um, the Venerable Royal Society for letting us sponsor this prize. Thank you, of course, to the authors for writing these marvellous books that open up to the layman and even to the scientist the incredible truths and frightening truths sometimes that it's possible to know about the world today as a result of the amazing advance of science. Thank you to the judges very much indeed for reading and reading so many books and making so many difficult decisions. Thank you to the guests for coming. <laughs> Thank you to the uh, staff of the Royal Society in Winton for organising the prize. Thank you to Dara for hosting it with charm and erudition. And thank you very much to the journalists in advance for all the times you're going to mention Winton in the news coverage. <laughs> well, what a feast of books we've had tonight. Um, fishing less, catching more. Impossibly real beasts. Memory and fantasy. Life's creative principles. The God particle forgive me, the God particle, and of course, orgasmic birds. <laughs> well, we've, um, we've been entertained a lot, I think, this evening. Um, and it's all been brilliantly orchestrated by Dara O'Brien and generously supported by David Harding. Thank you both. Thank you. Now, this is the sort of um, <clears throat> BAFTA or Oscar moment for the Royal Society. We don't normally um, go in for this sort of drama. But we are about to announce 
the 2013 winner of the Royal Society Winton Prize for Science Books. The winner of the 2013 Royal Society Winton Prize for Science Books is The Particle at the End of the Universe by Sean Carroll. So I, I had prepared um, only 30 or 40 slides about quantum field theory, if that's, uh, if that's okay. No, thank you enormously. Thank you uh, to Winton. Thank you to the Royal Society. It makes me think uh, there's a play that, that played in London a, a few years ago by Charlotte Jones called Humble Boy. I don't know if this is like world famous, but uh, the protagonist of the play was a physicist who basically fled to Cambridge and studied black holes because he found dealing with people too depressing. And uh, there's something to that. I mean, there's something to the absolute purity of studying science. You know, the equations are there, you're right or you're wrong. It's comforting and it, you know, it's, it's cheerful and so forth. But contrary to the uh, protagonist of this play, there's something even more uplifting to me about this, about the fact that people come out to hear talks and think about books about science. The fact that you can get a bunch of scientists in a room talking to each other and they're uh, very entertaining and people like to listen to it. Especially for what I do. I was thinking of, I was watching all these other authors up here and you know, their, their topics are all actually really meaningful to your everyday lives and mine is not. The, the thing that I wrote about, you know, the Higgs boson, um, like I said, the only reason why we devote so much effort to this is because it's the culmination of a 2,500-year-old project since Democritus and the ancient Greeks to uncover, to ask the questions, to figure out what our world is made of. And uh, there's no two or three physicists who could do it themselves. Uh, it's, it's a worldwide effort. And so enormous credit to the thousands of physicists who built the Large Hadron Collider, to the Winton Society, to DARA, to, uh, to the Winton, uh, um, what is it, Capital Management? Winton Capital Management. Uh, and to the whole country that I'm in right now, which has a much stronger tradition of public engagement with science to which we in the United States can only hope to aspire. Thank you. <laughs>